Hello, 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 ladies and gentlemen. You are listening to the West Cliff Climb. I am Pastor Joshua Duffy, and of course, I am here with my good friend, Dr. Paul Looney. Uh, we are, uh, wow, we got a great topic for you today. I am coming to you in the year 2023, celebrating my first season with the flu. That's right, the flu is back in style. It's back. It's back in full fashion. I got to meet it in 2023, and it is just as terrible as I remember it being. So uh, today's show is actually sponsored by Ricola. I'm kidding. <laughs> it's not. It's not. But I am back. And <laughs> thank you, Lord, for, for recovering from that hot mess. So, yeah. uh, Dr. Paul, how are you, brother? How are you doing today? Well, I am thankful I got my flu shot. Not not No guarantee that I won't suffer the same terrifying fate that you've uh, encountered, but, <laughs> but I'm hopeful that I won't. And of course, since we're virtual, I have no fear. That's um, it. But yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing great. I love the sunshine as always. And uh, happy to be here with you, Joshua. Well, we have a, we have a great topic. One that, uh, that bounces across the pond from here to the UK and back over again. One could argue it is a particular issue that seems to infect particularly Western society culture. Um, may, maybe not. Maybe it transcends all cultures. I'm not so sure. But it does seem to target us here in the States and over in the UK. Fascinating topic uh, that, that, Paul, you want to run with today. Why don't you introduce it to our folks? Take it away. All right. Well, I'm I'm pretty excited about talking about this because I'm very curious um, to know what our listeners have experienced and their reaction, but but we're 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 touching on something that it might be called the cancel culture. Um, there are a, a wave of phenomenon that that have spread throughout our country. People who are distancing themselves from things that make them uncomfortable, canceling friendships, uh, family members distancing from ideologies or political groups that uh, make one feel uncomfortable. I read a book not long ago called The Coddling of the American Mind mm. by Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff. And they, they explore this phenomenon uh, that's particularly disturbing on the university campus. Um, the university campus, they uh, point out, was at one point a place where you are going to be exposed to radically differing views from what you grew up with, uh, made uncomfortable and thinking about things from a philosophical or moral point of view that stirred the pot, that made you think, that made you feel uncomfortable. And indeed, that was the, the MO or modus operandi of the faculty to, to, to make kids think and make them feel uncomfortable with their assumptions. What the authors point out is that there's been a, this tidal wave of change sweeping across the country so that universities now are much more likely to censor or edit out ideologies or points of view that do not feel comfortable to the majority of the students attending. And so you have lectures being canceled, people being banned from campus, um, having the, the establishment of safe places where people don't have to be exposed to anything that makes them feel uncomfortable. And of course, we've, we've labeled a lot of um, conversation as hate speech if it makes people feel that they are being marginalized or distanced. And, and it's, it's particularly disturbing because it is in those very moments when we are up against something that is alien, that's foreign, that's... Uh, disturbing or antithetical to my position that I actually have the greatest capacity for growth, either yeah. change my position or through, through reasonable discourse to become more uh, firm and more grounded in my position that, that tension and opposition can actually strengthen us and allow us to grow um, in, in a transformational way or to grow in a deeping, deepening way that, that actually reinforces our position based on that pressure or um, 
discomfort of being faced with something that's distinctly alien. Right. And, and you know, what, what I almost find the dynamic right now, especially in our culture, that's fascinating. You know, in the 60s, it would be one of the hype moments of this where music, the counterculture, the arts were really expressing this movement against the the quote unquote machine, I guess, of, of was moving in one way and the youth and and um, our all kinds of artistic expression were, were going counterculture to that and and pushing against it. And it's so strange because it's almost like the arts today are the soundtrack for it, for the machine, yeah. which is such a strange thing. And yet people, it, it, but yet they almost still try to champion what what's happening as though they are picking up that torch when in fact they're not swimming upstream against the machine. They're actually now the band leaders have it. Right. And, and most people are not really catching that, which is super strange to me. Yeah. personally yeah I, th I think that's a great point joshua and the 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 phenomenon shows up in some very disturbing ways people feel very entitled to have their p opinion and not have it challenged people feel entitled to be feeling comfortable and safe and uh, and exempt from challenge or um adversity and it'll it enables people to again, to distance themselves from anything that makes them feel uncomfortable or seems difficult. Um, just this week, Prince Harry's book, Spare, has been released. And um, he and Meghan Markle, his, Meghan, his wife, um, have distanced themselves from, you know, they've gone across the pond from Harry's home um, in England because of a feeling of being um, disadvantaged in that family system, in the cultural system. And Harry, evidently, along with Meghan, has a, has a, they have a big beef against the way they've been treated. And, it, and unfortunately, one of the things, the consequences of avoiding things that make you feel anxious or uh, threatened in any way is that you actually give more power to those things to harm you. When people um, stay away from the highways or the skyways, if, if they're fear, afraid of flying or, or driving on the highways, um, the more you avoid something that makes you uncomfortable, the more it makes you uncomfortable. And unfortunately, when people take a stance where they feel like, well, I've been hard hit by life, and so I'm going to shelter in place, I'm going to, you know, back away from anything that could harm me, they actually become weaker rather than stronger. And I, I, I feel that it's very sad for Harry that while he grew up in a very privileged environment and, um, and from what we can tell, was loved by his mother, Diana, and by his dad and by the, the now deceased uh, grandmother, the Queen Elizabeth II, um, he, in spite of all that privilege, is coming across as something of a victim. And it's very sad because you don't want him to feel like he's the spare. Like you want him to feel like, hey, I'm a part of something hugely powerful and good. Um, was it a, a curse to be born second to William? Or is could that be a huge blessing to not be saddled with having to you know, think about bearing the the burden of the monarchy. Could it not be even a, a great advantage to Harry and to Meghan to be able to make a difference in the world without having to worry with being king and queen at some point? Right. Well, but I mean, to your point about the monarchy, it's not like he didn't see this coming his whole life. So, <laughs> you know, it's not like he woke up one day and went, oh, really? This is how this is going to play out for me. So like, this is kind of the thing I'm, I'm wondering is, is, is using this example is, is this a cautionary tale of right now, kind of the, uh, the whirlpool of just like the gravitational pull of culture, just going, be a victim. It's so great to be a victim. Oh, is there something that can make you a victim? You got to plant that flag. Oh, it's, is, is it that, or is it a cautionary tale of, 
be weary and very select, be very selected or selectful, whatever the correct term would be there, of who you pull into your inner world because the things that they're going to whisper into your ear uh, may turn you into somebody that you don't even want to be. Because back to my point in all seriousness, it's not like a guy like that didn't see this coming. Yeah. So is is the only the only shift now the person who he brought closest into his life who's now telling him, you know, you're really getting the shaft. You know, this really isn't right. You know, this really isn't the life that you thought it would be. And now he's become the toxic you yeah. know, um, puppet of the whole thing. So what, what, what's your take? Is it a combination of the two? Is it one more than the other? You know, just using this as an example, I think it's a great example and the whole world's paying attention. So what would you say? Well, when we struggle with anything, with this anxiety, depression, or failure, um, one of the ways that we can feel better the fastest is to point the finger of blame on somebody else. If I'm not all I should be, it's that person's fault. And unfortunately, a lot of people in my profession who are counselors, psychiatrists, psychologists, um, inadvertently fall into this trap by letting people off the hook. Well, oh, of course you're struggling because your father was a jerk. Your mother was controlling. You know, like the, the quickest way to make people feel better about their suffering is to point the finger of blame. Well, your wife is a witch. You know, your husband's a jerk. Um no wonder you're struggling because X happened to you or this or that. Right. And um, certainly we want to have compassion for ourselves when we have suffered. And there's no doubt that Harry has suffered slights or rejection or whatever. We yeah. all have yeah. there have been disappointments and, and they're very real and we can have compassion for him. But the difference between having compassion for yourself and for others and having pity on yourself or others or or feeling victimized is that um, compassion can empower you to get back up and to try again and to to realize that there there you know failure is inevitable and we all participate in this um, dark world and of suffering but but the idea with having a uh, an excuse to fall back on like, well, I, you know, I, people didn't like Megan because she's mixed race that she has, she has in her genetic pool, um, the, uh, black or, uh, African-American, uh, you know, okay. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not true. But what we want is to realize that whatever suffering that we endure or whatever opposition we encounter, it doesn't define us. That is like, no, that's not who we are. And, and you know, uh, I love the story of Joseph in the Bible who who was abused, who was downtrodden, who was uh, sold into slavery and accused of a crime he didn't commit and imprisoned. Um, but he had, had a sense of God's bigness. He said, am I God? You know, they meant it for evil, God meant it for good. And so what I would wish for Harry and for all of us is that we would be able to tell our story without it being spare, without it being, um, you know, oh, well, I had, you know, I got the shaft and therefore I have a right to separate myself from these people. Um, Joseph welcomed his brothers back into his life. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and certainly at, at a point they did take responsibility for their part in his pain. And I think it's reasonable for Harry to hope that if there were offenses against him and against Megan, that, that others would take responsibility, but their ability to, to bear up in the face of, um, that, uh, mistreatment, it, whatever, you know, it was it, that, that is what's going to make them feel better about themselves and not some sort of shift in the other person that it's it's really within me that i have to reclaim my sense of value even when the people around me don't see it the same way i do the problem that 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 really gets things entrenched joshua is that we need a story that makes us feel good about ourselves 
And as I said earlier, if I can, if I can t tag a storyline that makes me feel okay about exempting myself from life, from a relationship, yeah. cutting people yeah. off or canceling, then, then I have to craft that story so it looks bad enough that I feel justified in doing what I'm doing. Because what Megan and Harry have done has been very hurtful to a lot of people that, you know, loved Queen Elizabeth. My wife is especially fond of the royals and she follows all this stuff. I'm I'm not as <laughs> into it as she is, but she's deeply offended and wounded by this disruption in the royal family that has occurred because Meghan and Harry have chosen to distance themselves from his family. And we've had some of that pain in our own family that we've had family members who've pulled back because of a real or perceived slight and given no recourse for reconciliation or for, or, or for courteous engagement. Yeah. And you see this with divorced couples a lot. And I work because I'm a counselor. I work with couples who have gone through divorce and it takes a lot of strength to be able to be civil, cordial, and courteous with someone who may have cheated on you or yeah. been abusive or, you know, made your financial finances, a, a complete and utter failure. Yeah. But for the sake of civility, for the sake of the, the family, strong individuals find a way when they have to be in the presence of that person who has been hateful or hurtful to be able to be calm and courteous yeah. and kind, even if the other person doesn't deserve it. And that's, that's really what I hope that our listeners will hear yeah. is that, that you can choose for the sake of your own well-being, your own mental health, for your children, for society, to learn how to have courteous and kind discourse even with people who are um, are far from uh, your friends, like they're 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 not necessarily agreeing with you politically, spiritually, emotionally, but you can still um, see them as yeah. people worthy of respect because they're made in the image of God, and because I have an obligation to society to comport myself or conduct myself in a way that generates that respect for all human beings, even those that I think are far afield of what I believe God intends for, you know, for human beings. To, right. To be. Right. No, that, that, that is fantastic. And you know what, just thinking about you and Terry, if there's ever been two people that could actually fix the Royal family, it would be Paul and Terry Looney. <laughs> so if somebody knows the Royal family by seven degrees of, separation send down uh -huh. the private jet monarch royal air whatever it is meet you at iah get you out there and patch this thing up so let me ask you this because i saw a video here recently of a guy who basically i mean it's just heartbreaking his whole world got shattered and in the interview he lost so much family members all in a very short amount of time and he asked his counselor will i ever be happy again and I'm curious what your response would be to what this counselor said to him. He said, I don't know if the goal is for you to be happy again. I think the goal is to help you find purpose. And if you can find purpose, maybe some of these other things will start coming and falling into place. Now, I don't know if that's the greatest wisdom or the worst wisdom in the world, but where I'm going with it is in light of a person who's maybe taking on that victimhood mentality and that whole they you know they're falling under this weight right what degree does purpose defining a purpose defining a new direction defining a reason for moving forward what what can that play in this whole path of maybe if someone's listening to us and they're getting into the victim mindset and they've done the math on it and they're in the victim mindset cuz it works it yeah. all adds up it all makes sense they've justified it all away but somehow there's a little voice in their head that's like, you know, this is messed up. You know, and I think there's a degree of people that still have a little bit of that. They're like, yeah, I'm still miserable. I, I, I separated from everyone. I've stuck it to everyone I wanted to stick it to. 
and I'm still pretty empty as I was before all this started. It yeah. is something like purpose of going, okay, I thought my role and my purpose was X. It didn't work. I'm bitter about it. Finding a new direction. What does that look like in this whole? Well, first of all, I, I love the, the story that you shared with us about the man who'd been hard hit by life. And his counselor says, I'm not sure if the goal is to be happy, but to find purpose. I think that's very beautifully said. Um, I do think that finding happiness is something that we all wish for and long for. But the counselor, I think, is spot on with finding, before you pursue happiness, finding some sense of meaning and purpose. Your philosophy of life turns out to be not that critical when things are going well. When things mm. go south, you need to have a context for thinking about suffering that allows you to keep walking through the dark valley. Because without that, you're going to get stuck. You're going to stop moving. You, you may avoid the deepest part of the valley, but you're never going to get through it to the next mountain peak. And so in this, in this scenario with the, the, the counselor, the therapist suggesting purpose and meaning, I, I believe that um, what she or he was, was referencing in a sense is that, that suffering without meaning is unbearable. But if we have a philosophy of life or a context that suffering itself has value, and we've talked about this in another podcast that the Apostle Paul says, suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And mm -hmm. for this person who's been so hard hit, um, finding meaning, finding a sense of uh, ability to keep moving forward, to persevere, to get character that's where hope's going to come in. And as a side effect, some modicum or degree of happiness will, mm. will undoubtedly come about. But it takes time, and it takes that willingness to keep going. Um, if you look at Job's story, Job's wife took the position that when life hits you hard, you have every right to just shut it out. She says, just curse God and die. Just be done with all the suffering. And that's what cancel culture is. Essentially, it's saying like, you don't have to put up with this. You don't deserve this. You, you, know, you don't have to live this way. You can shut all the pain out. Well, is that a good, a good resolution to the problem? And for Job, it was not. He, you know, he's like, he, we don't know what he said to her, but we know he didn't take her counsel to just shut it all, shut it all down. Yeah. And that's what, you know, again, cancel culture does that suicide, of course, is the most powerful way of distancing yourself from all that could hurt you. But like suicide, canceling the, the, the immediate source of pain, um, to your point, Josh, doesn't necessarily end the suffering. Wow. You, I love what your point about having, I don't know if you said the right structure or lens when navigating what's going well in life, that when it all blows up, you know, it's kind of irrelevant what your philosophy of life is when it's going well till it all goes bad. And if you don't have the right structure in place, look out. So let me ask, okay, let's let's put on that lens for a second. I'm walking through life, Joe Schmo listening to us or Jane Schmo. Life is going great. I'm killing it. Life, you know, we're we're floating right along here. <laughs> so the question is. What would be what would what would be something that I need to be thinking of or a checklist or something I need to be mindful of of whether or not while things are going well in my life, am I am I viewing it in a correct lens so that I can be prepared or in a position to deal with if it ever changes or if it ever falls apart? How, is there a way of thinking about when things are going well in the moment so that I have them in the right perspective or you, does that make sense? So well, I'm not I just does. blindsided. That, exactly. So it has to do with a, having a context that takes you beyond yourself. So gratitude, when things are going well, is something that keeps us anchored in God. When we don't just like puff ourselves up and like, oh, I'm going to build bigger barns and store my shit. You know, like I'm not going to, I'm going to just like take it easy, eat, drink and be merry. Um, no, it's, it's that sense of humility and gratitude that we don't take for granted the good times. We, we enjoy them. We savor them. We, we drink them in. 
but we do it in the context of God as God. And so I believe Job did that. He enjoyed the good things that God gave him. But mm-hmm. you cannot really go deeper in your your grounding with God until the good times dry up and you have to send your roots down deeper to find a source of sustenance. And so so the the gratitude, worship, um, thanksgiving, praise, when things are going well, again, it keeps that context of God so that when the bottom drops out, yeah. you're in that you're in that bubble already and that you that you've got, you know, you've got something to to land on when the bottom drops out, when the rug gets pulled out from under you, you have something solid that's going to catch you. And it will be a hard hit and leave you dazed and confused, but you can get back up and go even further in understanding the goodness of God in the face of pain. Love it. Love it. So let's let's take a hard left turn, descend up 30,000 feet over the whole topic. Here we go. What are the contributing factors of a cancel culture? What what is it that creates an environment where a whole group of people are like, turn that guy off? You know yeah. what what makes what, what is that? Um, I think part of it is just you know a sociological thing. People have always distanced themselves from certain things, but but it's been it's made more possible in an environment where we don't have to depend on our community in the same tangible way that people did in the past, where we can order in our food. We don't have to leave the house. We don't, we can go shopping and not have to mess with anybody. Um, We can get online and connect with those who we want to connect with and unfriend those who we, we choose not to connect with. We can watch news that, that, panders to our point of view and doesn't challenge our thinking. Um, We have political disparities that allow us to imagine that we're good and they're the bad ones. Right. It's, it's, it's technologic, technologically, we can have the illusion of connection without actually being connected. And we can always find somebody online who will, totally buy into our story and give us exactly what we're looking for that affirmation like oh yeah you're oh yeah they're terrible you should definitely cut them out of your life they're toxic they're narcissistic they're but whatever label 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 and it'll it gives me permission then to exit the the conflict exit the distress exit the tension and just congratulate myself like oh you did the right thing they're terrible and you're not. So that's so interesting. What If I caught what you're saying, in essence, is that as affirmation culture goes, so does cancel culture. Yeah. So yeah. The, the more that we have people that will tell us and affirm our bias or affirm what we want to think and will egg us on, yeah. so will also our ability to cancel what we want to cancel. Yeah. And that's why, unfortunately, a lot of people who get counseling are more at risk of getting a divorce than those who don't get counseling. Because you have you go to counseling and the and the counselor says, "Oh, that's terrible. She said that to you. Oh, he did that. Oh, that's horrible. You need to get that's toxic. They're terrible. You'll feel better if you divorce them." And they're right. The immediate remedy for feeling st- the struggle and the strain of a difficult marriage is end it. Oh, problem solved for a moment. Yeah. But the problem really is in all of us. Like we all need to die to ourselves. And when we exit those bit difficult or painful circumstances, we are exiting an opportunity to grow and to die to ourselves. And that's yeah. tragic. Wow. Fantastic. You know, and I, I guess maybe to bring this full circle for us uh, is, uh, you know, 2000 years ago, people claimed that they wanted a Messiah. And the reality is they, they wouldn't say it with their lips, but they were very comfortable with the structure they had, the power structures that they had, the people that they had in play, the directions that the money moved, who held their positions, the authority that they had. And they finally marched one guy out in front of everybody and had no problem canceling him. And they just did it quickly with a vote. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. We'll take the the counterfeit Barabbas. He makes us feel good about ourselves because he's a lowly criminal. We're all better than him, 
right? And let's get rid of this other guy. We don't like his message. He makes us uncomfortable. He makes us all have to find some kind of meaning in him. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's, it is a fascinating dynamic. And, and even when we look at the biblical narrative, it's something that shows up 2000 years ago and we have it yeah. today. Wow. I'm so glad you brought that up, Josh, because it really was um, from a certain point of view, understandable that people wanted to cancel Christ. Um, because they had an ideal and I, an image of what he ought to be for them, that he mm. was going to be this political leader. He was going to, he was going to deliver them from Rome. And, you know, and, yeah. and a week before the cancellation, they were all going like, Hosanna, you know, like, yay, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were all about him yeah. until he did something. He, he let them down. Yep. He didn't show up in the way they thought he should and therefore like get rid of him, cancel him. And, and I think that that's really, you know, if you look at Mary and he Mary, Harry and Megan, um, you know, there's no doubt that his family being human made some missteps. No doubt that they let them down in terms of the fantasy that they both had about being royals and, you know, what that would mean for, Harry to Megan to Mary Megan, this you know beautiful uh, U.S. Uh, actress. Um, there's no doubt it fell short of their ideal, just like Jesus fell short of the ideal of his his contemporary uh, culture. They wanted something different than what he offered. Yeah. yeah. And and yet, um, what we see, you know, in in all of our lives, is that God will will sometimes fail to show up in the way that we wish for him to in order for us to press in like Job did instead of pulling out like his wife encouraged him to do. Wow. And so for all of us, for, for you and for me, for all of all those who are listening, just want to encourage you when things get tough in a relationship, see if you can press in rather than pull out. See if you can dig deeper to find your core convictions and to be able to hold your ground in the face of opposition or disappointment or rejection or discouragement to be more clear about being the woman or man that God made you to be hmm. that is not threatened by opposition, but rather yeah. thrives in the face of, of disparity and, and thrives in the, in the face of of diversity where we can be in conversation with those who are different. And it starts, it starts with our own souls. When we're in conflict with ourselves, it starts in our own homes. We're in conflict with our kids or our parents. Um, it starts at the workplace where there's conflict and we have tension in our churches and our business um, because we see things so radically differently. But if you can press in rather than pulling out and trust God, to give you love for those who hate you, who despise you, who say all kinds of evil against you. It's, Jesus is so countercultural. And he he says, no, don't cut those people out. Um, I, you know, your father sends rain on the evil and the good. He sends the sun on the just and the unjust. He doesn't cancel you mm -hmm. when you disagree with him. Mm -hmm. And that's where really what I hope that our our listeners will take from this is that that God gives us second chances. He wants us to engage with him, even when he doesn't show up the way that he, we wish, because he engages with us even when we don't show up in the way he would wish us to. Yeah, He's yeah. loving, he's faithful, he's slow to anger. Um, he's he's re always reaching out, like we talked about last week, him reaching out to Cain in that moment of Cain's anger, inviting reconciliation. And so I hope that all of us will be those ministers of reconciliation and um, seek to build bridges where they've been blown up and to um, to open doors in walls that have been barricaded. So anyway, I'm, I'm really glad that you've uh, invited me to this discussion, Joshua. I, I hope it is helpful. That was fantastic. That's the bow. That's the bow. We've blown through a half hour, folks already that fast across the pond and back like a flight on the Concord. We already did it. It's over, finished. 
Dr. Paul, would you mind, sir, leading us in a word of prayer? Thank you, Joshua. Love to. God, um, we thank you that you are the God of reconciliation. You're the God of peace. Jesus is our Prince of Peace, our wonderful counselor, our mighty God. God, thank you that he takes on responsibility for restoring the bridge that had been blown up by sin, by selfishness, by our own rebellion against you. God, thank you that he engages with us and, and did not fail to engage even when it cost him everything. God, we're tempted as Jesus was in the garden to back away from rejection, to back away from abuse, to back away from um, punishment and, and degradation. But God, when you ask us to follow Jesus, to take up our cross, um, to trust you with our lives, we want to do it wholeheartedly. We want to know that it honors you when we continue to engage with those who might mistreat us or treat us badly. And God, I just pray for everyone in our culture who is tempted to back away from legitimate pain of trying to love those that that may be unlovely at times, that you would strengthen our resolve. You would give us wisdom and grace, that you help us to speak the truth in love and to press in rather than pulling out. God, thank you that we are people of faith and that we don't have to live in fear, that we're people of courage. We don't have to live in cowardice, that we're people of your promise and we don't have to live in our own pride of, of managing things. We can trust you and we can surrender control to you because you will at the final day make everything right as we surrender to you. God, thank you for Jesus who led the way in surrendering and being a minister of reconciliation. Make us like him. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. We love you guys and we will see you next week. Bye. Bye-bye.